We all live in the digital world. We all need it to be open and safe. We all want to trust. And to be trusted. We all despise control. And desire freedom. We, we are all, all united. united. Well, welcome all, both those in Poland joining us there and those that are joining remotely. It is a pleasure uh, to start this discussion. Uh, for those of you who are wondering, Mike might, might have linked, uh, gotten the link. This is the session called uh, Exploring Neutrality, a Multi-Stakeholder Cyber Norms Dialogue. So welcome all. I'm Louise Marie Urell. I am a, a researcher, a PhD researcher over at the London School of Economics, but I'm also a special uh, digital policy advisor at the Europe Institute's uh, digital security program. And I will be the moderator for the session. And together with me, I do have a, a stellar lineup of, of panelist speakers. So the way this is going to go, we're going to have two rounds of of discussions and interventions from uh, the panelists, uh, which will be preceded by a presentation from Sean, which I will introduce very quickly, just to set the scene of what neutrality means in the context of cyberspace. I think those that are more uh, from an international law background might be wondering how can we connect or what are the gaps in terms of thinking neutrality in that context of, uh, responsible state behavior in cyberspace of thinking also that relationship with the existing norms that have been agreed upon in the context of the um, United Nations group of governmental experts or the open-ended working group, which ended and it's just about to restart um, next week. So I think this is a very timely discussion for all of us in a context where of increasing risk, threats, and conflicts, uh, mainly driven by increasing cybercrime, but also geopolitical tensions and competition. So at the same time, cyberspace is also now an important domain of interaction, human interaction for our societies. But as our societies sort of continue to digitalize, even more so with COVID-19, we're increasing sort of dependent on ICTs, and as such vulnerable to digital disruption, which can engender significant harm and human suffering. We therefore need to have sort of a continuous discussions on the ways of stabilizing the space. This includes sort of discussing different mechanisms such as international law, but also norms of behaviors, trust building initiatives. And in our opinion, it also includes sort of reevaluating or discussing neutrality. But before addressing neutrality and discussing it further, it's important to sort of define it, especially as it's kind of a complex, very flexible, multifaceted concept whose understanding and application has evolved uh, across geopolitical and technological context and historical too. In practice, neutrality can imply or represent a set of legal principles, rights and duties, but also behavioral traits, um, practices, reputations, or even organizational sort of or state policies. Um, traditionally, neutrality is linked to expectations of non-participation, impartiality, and some form of due diligence in exchange for some sort of protections from harm and guarantee of independence. Again, historically, it has also served many other functions, such as ensuring continuous international commerce or promoting and fostering international peace and security. It has also been used to mitigate escalation or fostering social cohesion. One of the main sort of aspects of neutrality is its legal core, namely the law of neutrality. Um, this is something uh, we examined in detail in our recent publications, which sort of provides an overview of the historical technological evolution and the sort of legal debates and views as to the application of the law of neutrality in cyberspace. It will be posted in the chat, so I invite you to check if you're interested. So generally speaking, the law of neutrality uh, per se regulates the relation between the belligerent and neutral states during an international armed conflict. It was codified in 1907 after sort of centuries of evolving state practice and hasn't evolved much since. Um, I had a nice little table that sort of summarized uh, the different sort of uh, rights and duties, but it's mainly um, that we can summarize this into as follows. Sort of put it simply, a neutral is to abstain from a conflict and from providing belligerent with assistance. Uh, it must also terminate certain violations of neutrality uh, happening in its territory. 
Uh, meanwhile, it must also treat all actors impartially and non-discriminatively. And at the opposite, the belligerent must respect the inviolability of neutral territory. This means not using it for certain hostile conduct, such as moving troops, weapons, or materials of war, uh, not recruiting combatants uh, in neutral territory, nor to attack neutral territory and the infrastructure. As for the law of neutrality in cyberspace, there is a legal argument to its application, which goes back to the ICT's uh, opinion on the legality of the threat for use of nuclear weapons, which generally states that no doubt that the principle of neutrality is applicable to all international armed conflict, whatever the type of weapon might be used. However, neutrality in cyberspace remains quite a niche topic that has the potential to develop. For now, only six states have referenced it explicitly and discussed it in their legal opinion. These are Switzerland, the Netherlands, the US, Romania, Italy, and France. The Tallinn and the Oslo manuals also have some rules with regard to neutrality in cyberspace. Here I had a sort of a nice uh, snapshot of the different opinion juris. But um, as we can see is that there's a lot of um, different states sort of cover different aspects uh, and put the emphasis on different sort of uh, rights and duties um, of neutrality in cyberspace. Um, and what we can notice is that some of these rules are relatively undisputed, such as conducting cyber operations from or against neutral infrastructure under sovereign protection, while other, while recognized, um, still need further discussions to be operationalized. And this is especially the case for the prevention or uh, issues about the legality of routing cyber operations through neutral infrastructure. But generally speaking, there's still many questions that remain with regards to the scope of applications of these rules. Um, including the larger repercussions or duties or rights for other actors involved in cyberspace. But neutrality isn't limited to its legal aspect. It can take other forms. For instance, neutrality can be leveraged as part of a permanent neutral actor digital, foreign, and security policy. Uh, here we can underline different examples or initiatives such as actors to provide, such as facilitating dialogue or providing some digital good offices. We can also think about supporting capacity building or legal or technical capacity building, uh, providing neutral fact-finding activities or forensic analysis. It also sort of brings a number of uh, additional questions with regards to neutrality policy. For instance, what kind of partnerships uh, in the digital space are allowed? What kind of uh, sort of attribution is uh, sort of recommended or not? Can a neutral actor participate in sanctions? Neutrality is also a humanitarian principle necessary for actors to provide sort of assistance or mediation. Uh, for instance, the ICRC rests upon its perceived neutrality, independence, and impartiality to provide and ensure its actions in the field. But leveraging digital technologies has created some challenges. Indeed, now it's exposed to risk of cyber espionage, cyber attacks, and disinformation that could generally undermine its reputation of neutrality. Neutrality can also be claimed by private actors. Uh, one concept being that of commercial neutrality, where the private or technical actors provide neutral technical goods or services that help reduce cyber threats. For instance, mitigating and neutralizing attacks or malicious traffic without considering the origins of such attacks. And finally, we could also envision neutrality being applied to infrastructure. That regard is, of course, net neutrality, which is about not discriminating between different types of data. And as such, we'll not cover this here as there's enough panels on it uh, at the ITF. But one might also want to consider the call for a neutral public core of the internet as a public good and as a way to protect it uh, from attacks and prevent its weaponization. And on that note, I'll pass it back to you, Louise. Thanks again. Thanks very much, Sean. I think we touched upon, you touched upon several different elements that uh, will perhaps come back over and over again in this discussion, uh, which in my perception is a question of territory, a question of actors, uh, how we also interpret neutrality, not only through uh, international law, but also through a wider scope of, of norms of responsible behavior, but even more so, I mean, as a person that comes from international relations, I guess I'm always questioning uh, whether, you know, what, who is neutral, who gets to say what becomes neutralized, um, be it a territory, uh, a network, a core, or a particular function. So I'm hoping that we can further unpack this as we go. So now to our kind of first round. Um, and I'd like to push us all um, or 
put us all into a particular part of the discussion right now to all the panelists. Um, so we heard about this uh, research that was published by ETH Zurich um, and Sean provided this overview of the concept slash principle of, of neutrality. Um, but does it make sense to think about neutrality in the context of growing tensions of state sponsored cyber attacks? How, how have you in your own kind of um, everyday work, uh, be it as a scholar, as a practitioner, how do you conceptualize, how do you see the concept of neutrality and what activities is it actually useful for thinking? So if you're coming from a civil society organization, what does that mean? So I would like to provoke you all to think about this nexus between what it means, the concept that was just presented and the activities that you have to regularly do. So let's go on the following order. I'll just go Jan, Maurice, uh, Otavia, Anastasia, and Koichiro. So let's start with Jan. Okay, thank you very much. Can you hear me? Yes. Perfect. Um, so what I'd like to talk about is um, specifically the uh, due diligence norm, which I think is going to be the most relevant part from the laws of neutrality. Um, and one thing to say at the beginning, just because these rules are old doesn't mean they're not applicable, um, because states have made deliberate decisions not to develop these rules over time, and states tend to not give themselves due diligence rules, but develop them in periods on conflicts and crisis when they frame their expectations of each other. So in a way, the laws of neutrality are, are forged by fire. And the principles driving the key precedents are timeless and directly applicable to cyber. And I'd just like to throw a couple of examples out here. Um, usually states will sue for compensation after something has happened and demand um, compensation for due diligence violations. So classic case here is the first ICJ case, the uh, Corfu Channel case, um, which shows that um, these norms are designed for the gray zone. That is an important part here, because uh, we always complain that there's this gray zone of cyber conflict that classic laws can't quite catch. And Corfu Channel is about the UK and Albania suing each other. Um, and they were not at war at the time. They're applying due diligence and the laws of neutrality, but they had friendly relations at the time. And um, so it shows that these concepts can actually be applied in this kind of context of the fringes of the Greek civil war, but not directly involved around it. The decision in the case of uh, about, over the mines that damaged the British vessels uh, has another important feature for cyber, namely it shows that the due diligence norm does not require attribution. Um, in the entire case, it was never determined who led the mines in Albanian waters that damaged British vessels. It was enough that they were there and the court concluded Albania should have known of their existence and warned the British vessels. So we can then extrapolate for that and think about, does that mean then in cyberspace, there's a duty to monitor certain networks to make sure that, for example, government owned critical infrastructure is not used to start cyber attacks by third states against other states. Um, another interesting case to look at is the Alabama Tribunal, which is uh, about the US receiving compensation from Britain for the violation of due diligence neutrality duties during the US Civil War. Um, which shows that even though it may not be clear in writing in the relevant laws at the time, states expect certain levels of bureaucratic capability from each other and are not afraid to demand compensation if they are not met. So in this case, Britain had to pay because it did not act quickly enough upon American requests for action. And we could then ask, does this require a duty to prepare for dealing with cyber incidents, sort of what level of competence is reasonable and appropriate for any state to have in 2021 and beyond? Um, can states get away as the state of the law is at present with not, with not preparing at all? Um, it also shows that states expect neutrals not to allow rebel groups being equipped with weaponry that has the potential to change a conflict, even if it is provided by a private company acting from the territory of a neutral. So this ties in with current debates about NSO and the question of export licenses for cyber weapons. Uh, and we can see quite interesting state practice moving in this direction. So um, 
happy to discuss all this in, in, uh, in a lot more detail. Um, but uh, what I'd like to end on is to say all of the potential norms flowing from these old cases that I've just suggested today are discussed in the Talon manual and explicitly rejected as present international law and state duties. But what the precedents show us is that even in the case of an unsettled law, um, such ju judgments, if in the particular case, the tribunals decide that states have acted unreasonably and violated due diligence, um, they can find themselves paying out compensation, even though they have not violated written rules at the time. Um, they develop in crisis situations and um, this is where we need to look out for uh, the development of due diligence duties and uh, the laws of neutrality in cyberspace. Thank you. Very good. Thanks so much, Jan. Um, I think that's definitely a very thought-provoking way to start. Um, uh, really kind of trying tr trying to contain myself in order not to derail the conversation and go deep into due diligence. So let's uh, go ahead and pass it over to Maurice. Yeah, hello, everybody, and sorry for joining a little bit late. Um, well, my, my, my introduction words will be about uh, conceptualization and activities. I mean, uh, we are part of the uh, strategic level at uh, MOD, Switzerland. And we have to think about the uh, impact uh, of neutrality and the cyber world and the security policy. And uh, we have to think about it uh, as a state in general, as a state and in general. And uh, I have to precise uh, after the introduction words of uh, Sean, that Switzerland has an active armed neutrality policy. So uh, we have to try to understand, to translate what it means according to rights and duties. Uh, internally in our own country and administration, according to the fact that we are neutral and should benefit of the conditions of this status, focus on what it means in terms of type of security, scope of defense, stakeholders, partners, and prioritization. In general, I'm speaking about critical infrastructure. Uh, we, we have to take into consideration uh, the, the, fuzzy, the fuzzy borders of both concepts of uh, cyberspace and neutrality. This leads to uh, principles that we all know are not globally fully fixed or commonly understood. And the duty is to precise the way that uh, all the organization uh, from all their various different point of view have to understand the main view on neutrality and cyber space. For instance, cybersecurity, which is about, I would say, the economic word, the main functions of our countries. The second thing is cyber diplomacy. And this, of course, is very important because neutrality is not only a status, but also a promotion instrument. And then cyber defense, which is about sovereignty and the rules according to how to behave with belligerence. But we know that the cyber, I would say, war is below a certain threshold. And of course, we do not have to forget fighting cybercrime. And what is the meaning of neutrality uh, regarding fighting cybercrime? So there is a continuous effort to understand the ever-changing context to ensure a balance between the use and the promotion of the principle of neutrality. I wanted to emphasize this in the beginning. Now, externally considering, considering relationships with foreign countries, because we are talking about neutrality and about states, in order to share experience, best practices, to train or even exercise together, here also there is a strategic view on neutrality. And we must consider, analyze, define thresholds above which we cannot go. I mean, in general, active and passive measures. Now, in fact, uh, neutrality is also about cooperation in peacetime and below the threshold of armed conflict, of armed cyber 
conflict or armed conflict through cyberspace. And because of the a priori global open aspect of the internet, <laughs> which is the dimension of the cyberspace, the challenge is about guaranteeing interoperability within and in neutrality. So Switzerland is not part of NATO, is not a EU member, but it's a player, a player within Partnership for Peace and uh, Switzerland is part of OSCE. So you see, these are the uh, concepts that we are dealing with and try to focus on. I would like to, to go further. I tried <laughs> to introduce kind of a model regarding the activities that we have to focus on with considering neutrality. And it's a model that I would call five Ps. It's not Porter's model, which you most probably know. It's part and prevent, protect, promote principles. So let's have a look at partners, for instance. And partners or partners and prevention could lead to digital supply chain. So what does it mean, neutrality, according to digital supply chain? Below or above this threshold we addressed before. Uh, are they some mm -hmm. neutral zones, DMZ? So it's about risk mitigation. It's about agility and digitalization, dependence, autonomy, neutrality is not only above this threshold, has to be understood also before we go to the status where neutrality becomes active. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Excellent. Thank you so much, Maurice. Uh, I was reminded of uh, one of our leading discussions to this panel, which you mentioned uh, the axis of complexity, right? Of thinking neutrality as this uh, encounter, as we said previously, of um, considering the actors, the processes, the territory, and as you said, you know, the activities that might most of the times be below the threshold of armed conflict. And what does it mean to pinpoint when neutrality is kind of incorporated in that sense. Uh, I think Sean presented some elements there, but uh, we'll definitely return to that discussion in just a short moment. So now, um, so we heard about kind of a historical perspective, um, kind of a state perspective, and now going to Otavia for a discussion on, you know, civil society perspective, uh, incident kind of looking at the incidents that are happening in the front line as well. Yes, thanks a lot. Um, it's a very, it's, it's a pleasure to be here today. So um, as uh, Louise mentioned, I'm going to focus on, uh, on neutrality as um, humanitarian values. I'm just going to bring a different perspective uh, to the table, I guess. Um, so um, I would like to start with the idea, and I think we can all agree on it, that neutrality is a vital principle for the protection and promotion of human rights and fundamental freedoms offline as well as online. So based on this, um, I truly believe that it makes absolutely sense to think about and discuss neutrality in the context of uh, increasing cyber attacks. The challenge is it's just very hard to apply concretely. So I'm just going to try to tell you a bit how we do that at uh, the Cyber Peace Institute. Um, and I uh, would like to start from the idea that at the Institute, neutrality is a core principle of our mission and activities because uh, as an organization, we are an independent and neutral non-governmental organization with the mission of ensuring uh, the rights of people to security, dignity, and, and equity in cyberspace. Um, so as you can imagine, we try to have um, the principle of neutrality embedded in everything we do because we see it as one of the cornerstones to achieve cyber peace. So for us, neutrality means that uh, the Institute supports the stability and security of cyberspace rather than the interests of individual actors. Um, and so um, neutrality is not only a behavioral trait of the organization itself, but it becomes a principle, um, right and duty, uh, to on one side support cyber attack victim or potential targets, regardless of uh, their location, beliefs or identity. Uh, but on the other side, um, neutrality is also the principle right and duty to treat all parties equally and impartially. And we do that uh, by providing evidence-led data that can shed light on what is behind a cyber attack, ideally even who, but that's very hard uh, going back to attribution. Um, so if you look at neutrality as a behavioral trait, um, cyberspace could be defined as a neutral space in a way, as it has been conceived as an open uh, free internet, right? So 
we look at cyberspace as, um, as a, an environment where people um, have the opportunity to be connected all around the world, to access new resources and to seek and for help and assistance. So operationally speaking, neutrality in cyberspace becomes um, the access to knowledge as well as the access to protection. And uh, we believe this is very important because as stated by GGE norm, states have the obligation to promote the right to freedom of expression, regardless of frontiers or um, and through any media. And so at the Institute, we stand by these values um, as it is our, in, in our mission to protect cyber space for the uh, neutral space we think it can and should be. Uh, and to give you a practical example, for many of our beneficiaries, which are humanitarian NGO NGOs we provide cybersecurity support to, um, cyberspace is a new and it's a new whole dimension uh, where they can help even more the vulnerable communities they already support. So it's literally a place to build uh, trust. And so the principle of neutrality applies um, in our everyday um, work in protecting vulnerable uh, communities by providing free cybersecurity support to those humanitarian NGOs that provide uh, critical services to vulnerable communities and populations. So uh, neutrality has been a core value in the uh, development and implementation of the Cyberpeace Builders, uh, which is a network of cybersecurity experts that uh, volunteer their working time to protect NGOs online. So with the builders, uh, we aim to ensure self-defense and prevent the misuse of uh, critical infrastructure targeted by cyber attacks. So we think humanitarian NGOs should be considered as critical infrastructure because in many countries, um, in many parts of the world, uh, populations rely on these NGOs to get food, clean water, healthcare services, and education. These might be realities very far from us, but it is still a reality um, out there. Um, and on top of this, um, other ways we look at neutrality is, um, is more on the accountability in cyberspace, because um, in this neutrality has a lot of uh, meaning because neutrality and transparency play an important role, role in holding malicious actors um, accountable. So for example, at the Institute, um, neutrality function also by analyzing uh, the impact of cyber attacks, not only uh, from a financial point of view uh, impact, but also from a societal and a human um, point of view. And so, for example, with a focus on critical infrastructure and healthcare, uh, we launched the Cyber Incident Tracer, um, which is a, a neutral platform that provides data-driven understanding of the impact of cyber attacks on healthcare organizations. And all this data is out there available to everybody. So for us, this is a way of applying the principle of neutrality uh, once again. And, um, and finally, this uh, human-centric approach uh, to analyze cyber attacks is also very important to um, process uh, to, to support uh, victims of cyber attacks in, in getting justice, but also to have their stories um, heard by, uh, by the whole community. Thank you. Thanks very much. And that was a perfect timing, Otavia. Thanks for that. Um, so I, I guess now we're transitioning to kind of a very practical oriented, activities oriented kind of perspective. And it's really interesting to see, Otavia, from your kind of intervention, how neutrality takes on kind of this also multifaceted perspective from the NGOs uh, side, not only in providing kind of some kind of assistance and being there, but also NGOs working with other NGOs that might be working in frontline kind of humanitarian environments, let's say, or even in kind of situations where uh, there's just a need to provide some kind of assistance to people in specific communities. And how do we think about neutrality, not as this kind of perhaps out there, very high level discussion, but something that really helps operationalize a needed kind of practice of uh, protecting not only human rights, but also protecting kind of specific communities. Um, so thanks for that. Now we're continuing perhaps on, on a similar kind of pathway uh, on kind of going and zooming in now in the private sector. So Anastasia, over to you. Thank you so much and hello to everyone. Um, it's a really interesting topic and I answer it directly to the question, does it make sense to think about neutrality in the context of growing tensions? I would definitely say yes, it does a lot of sense, especially right now amidst the growing militarization of cyberspace, which I think many experts have been reading already. It's really a timely topic. Um, well, having a sort of neutrality as a principle or as a law, 
it's hard for me, of course, to be precise and correct here in terms of the terminology. But in essence, to have a sort of neutral status for um, a third community, for incident responders, for cybersecurity researchers, about whom actually I think, first of all, those are my colleagues who um, work in this field, who track advanced um, IPD actors who uh, provide the threat intelligence report, but also thinking about humanitarian organizations, uh, which I think Atavia represents here as a Cyber Peace Institute, it would be absolutely great and helpful to have this neutral status. Um, why? Well, because I think even though 100% neutrality cannot exist, and I think we should be realistic about that, everyone has its customer user base, search, have their constituencies uh, to serve, and even in the event of a cyber incident, we all will be driven to, first of all, help to our users. But still, it's important also to focus on the fact that the role is to help, and this role should stay no matter what political or geopolitical context, and this is very important for them as a fireman, no matter, again, what political or geopolitical context exist. And of course, um, this is for states to define how the law of neutrality applies, uh, what it applies, what actually uh, it means, and especially given the unusual, I guess, for states, uh, really significant control of private sectors in cyberspace. It's um, still, I think, it's prerogative of the states to answer the question if the also neutrality could be applied to the non-state actors and um, international organizations. I'm a bit skeptical that, pragmatically speaking, we would have a sort of um, an instruction from states telling ABC how it is applied and what is is precisely. But still, I think it should not um, prevent or discourage us to continue calling for a sort of universal international framework, which might help raise awareness of the fact that again, researchers, incident responders, uh, humanitarian organizations need to be able to do their job and they should not be involved in the political context. If again, if there's a cyber incident taking place because their job is to continue helping people, is to continue dealing with the cyber incident. Another challenge, of course, is to draw, draw the lines between peace and war times. Um, this is what we specifically discussed before this session with my colleagues. I really wanted to hear their views, how they see, and we've actually raised a really important question, how to define between the normal and the conflict times. Um, it would definitely require lots of the international discussions and agreement about what constitutes normal. I think it's tricky and difficult to define it because the capabilities of the cyber world make a distinction between the normal and one much less clear. And it's one of the actually challenges to understand um, what's happening and who actually can have this neutral status during the cyber incident. Lots of the operations below taking place below the thresholds. Um, I think this has been really brilliantly highlighted in the uh, research uh, be before the, the roundtable discussion. And also lots of the operations still taking place in secrecy. And we may only know about them only some after, uh, after it actually has been public. But at the same time, again, being pragmatic and practical here, if we speak about how to make those um, law of neutrality, again, or neutral status operationalized, I think it would be really great if we would have, of course, would speak about some of the rights and the duties. And I would here totally agree with Maurice, who said about that. For instance, obviously requiring greater transparency from these uh, organizations, individuals about their activities. For instance, what they produce and sort of threat intelligence, whom they produce this threat intelligence report, how they operate globally. Then due diligence, if they are aware of any vulnerabilities exploited uh, already, if they are aware of some significant vulnerabilities that might be exploited, or they already have the knowledge about some incident taking place and they could help to terminate this incident. So I think at least these two points and perhaps um, some other points might actually be in the scope of those neutrality responsibilities if the organizations want to have them um, during the cyber incident. At Kaspersky, um, well, it's we try to still, I think, improvise, improvise and uh, understand how much we could be transparent here, just to um, give some examples. Um, we sometimes 
well, quite often a part of different cybercrime investigations, whether it take place at the national, regional, or international level. We're really proud to cooperate with Interpol. Interpol is one of the key partners for us with its diverse um, network of the other private partners. Um, one of the steps that we voluntarily decided to do is to be transparent about how many requests we actually receive from the local law enforcement agencies and from the international organizations. And we uh, first published it uh, earlier this year, uh, our law enforcement government request report mm -hmm. to highlight what the requests come for the user data and which requests come for the technical expertise, technical analysis, or sort of the threat intelligence, mm -hmm. where we again would like to be um, helpful. So we try to do this, but of course, 30 having seconds. A more, <laughs> sorry, having a more um, clarity, what those uh, organizations might do would be obviously very helpful. Thank mm -hmm. you. Perfect. Thanks so much, Anastasia. Um, I will do kind of the, the overall kind of thread that we're constructing here. But before I do that, let me just pass it on directly to uh, Koichiro to talk to us about the incident response kind of perspective of that. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, my name is Koichiro from JPSAT-CC. Uh, so in responding to cybersecurity incidents, uh, it is common that a response work involves more than three countries, uh, Belgian and South parties. I'll give you a few examples. When a massive DDoS attack was launched by North Korea against South Korea and US financial institutions, the malware program was distributed by a website hosted in Japan and Malaysia. When the emails of Macron campaign were leaked during the French presidential election, some of them were hosted in US, some of them are hosted in Japanese online forums. So one of the mission of suits is to take down inappropriate or malicious content from the internet. If such response should be, uh, and such responses should be carried out in a timely manner, especially for a national search of a neutral state. Uh, so this is, this is a significant task in peacetime or below threshold situation. In this sense, I think the existence and fully functional third is a cornerstone that ensure neutrality of a state. Now, when applying neutrality law to cyberspace, my biggest question is how to deal with tech giants. They may, they may be out of neut neutrality law scope. However, they are in fact the ruler of space, jeopardize the territorial sovereignty of states. Uh, when the concept of public of the internet was proposed years ago, uh, internet was a shared asset. Turning to 2021, few tech giants dominate the public of the internet. They are laying undersea cables, building data centers, and providing online services to the world using semiconductor parts that they themselves design. So the autonomous and decentralized nature of the internet is rapidly dis disappearing. And the spirit of neutral and non-neutral coexist within each tech giants. Uh, tech giants have made it clear that they are, uh, they are equ equ equidistant from all governments around the world. Uh, it is clear uh, when reading the tech code a few years ago, published a few years ago, they are clear on you know, protecting against tampering or uh, tampering or exploitation of product and services uh, during development design phases. Uh, so it is clear that the company does not want to have a special relationship with any government so as to ensure the human rights or growing their global businesses. Uh, so they like to be neutral in one sense, however, the tech giants are not neutral in some respects. Uh, if a tech giant in one country builds and operates a dedicated data center for, uh, for the use by another country's military or defense department, it is not appropriate to describe the, that tech giant uh, as neutral. The Ministry of De uh, US Ministry of Defense uh, Cloud Data Center um, was, uh, so my, Microsoft, uh, is preparing the uh, US military data center and is most likely a military object 
as defined by the additional protocol to the Geneva Convention. So the tech giants are weighing the benefit of remaining neutral and the benefit of causing up to a particular government. And their next step has more influence than the any single government's intention or their interpretation of international law. I'd like to stop here. Thank you. Thanks, uh, Koichiro. I think um, that, that gives us kind of an overall kind of multi-stakeholder vision of what neutrality can mean uh, for each actor. So we went from, a, as I said, a historical perspective where, you know, Jan took us through the lessons learned uh, in it throughout the years. So how can we think now in this context, thinking about the talent manual and other kind of resources as well of how due diligence can help beyond, you know, the attribution, let's say bottleneck to think about protecting networks. Um, but then comes the question of capacity, right? Who is capable and whether a state is capable of actually protecting their own kind of infrastructure. So that is when food for thought they are beyond the monitoring, which could also mean, you know, how are these states monitoring, but are they going beyond the scope of what they should be doing? Um, and then comes the whole discussion around active kind of active cyber defense um, that we can uh, further discuss here. Then obviously we went through Mohis that that took us from a state perspective, thinking about neutrality, also in terms of interoperability as capacity building, which is something that Jan also kind of touched upon, uh, saying that we need to define the thresholds, but then obviously another question just to provoke our discussion here is that of whenever a state publishes their, their views on the applicability of international law, depending on how they do it, that or other mechanisms that they're doing it, how much are they kind of just being very kind of the more transparent they are, the more it is easier for other actors, malicious actors to know which where the threshold is and, and play around with that if we if we stick to that. So just bringing a provocation there. On the CSO side, we also went through kind of this vision of neutrality as the status, uh, as kind of the protection of the status of NGOs working in frontline, um, but also as a way of the continuation of their services uh, in these kind of humanitarian contexts, let's say, uh, just for the sake of kind of tailoring and bringing kind of a, a wrap around that. Then we went to kind of a private sector side and Anastasia, I, I'm really glad that you kind of brought that, that point of no actor is necessarily neutral. I was waiting for that to come at a certain point. And obviously, I mean, when it comes to the private sector, it can mean this relationship with, with different shareholders, but in terms of states and even kind of uh, different organizations, it can be tied to funding, where you're getting your funding from. From states, it can be the different activities and services that you're engaging in uh, or operations that you're engaging in and whether that configures as some kind of um, uh, beyond kind of like what would be considered neutral. And finally, I mean, the third perspective, uh, which was uh, particularly interesting and just like the private sector has been developing these norms, but at the end of the day, what happens when you're actually engaging in the provision of services that are related to kind of the military objectives of, of a particular country is, you know, and, and is that okay when we're thinking about neutrality beyond the state kind of defined perspective according to uh, international law? And I think, you know, one of the findings of the paper that Sean presented um, and that's over there is is basically, you know, uh, neutrality according, you know, to to international law. It's 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 not, it, it's a state thing. It's, it's something restricted to states. And obviously it has uh, something really related to the territory that we can discuss a little bit more, but what happens when we start looking at non-state actors, right? Uh, how blurry and fuzzy that is. Great, I just wanted to kind of give us this, uh, this overall vision uh, of our discussion because I think, you know, we're set up for a very complex mapping exercise here. Um, and now, I mean, just to kind of bring us uh, down to really concrete elements that we can dive deep into, I just wanted to go to the second round and I'm gonna ask you uh, four minutes intervention each, just reminding of our, our structured plan um, for us to go now towards uh, testing international norms, right? We have the GGE, we have the OEWG, we have different uh, 
different set of norms that have been agreed upon. And so how can we operationalize neutrality in the context of these norms? And what are the promises and shortcomings of doing so? So let's do the same round. Uh, Jan, you first. Okay. Um, well, uh, I think I'll start by pointing out that I once more due diligence uh, as, as sort of the, the, the key neutrality norm in cyberspace, in my view, um, was included in the so-called zero draft of the uh, um, open-ended working group at the United Nations, um, but was dropped from the final draft. So interestingly, the um, the um, DGE includes due diligence as a state duty in cyberspace, but the open-ended working group doesn't. So that shows that it's controversial. And from what I've heard, it's it's been a couple of powerful states that did not want due diligence in this report because they feared it might be operationalized to uh, include certain duties that they might not want to see widely applied or applied to them. So let's take a look at what that might have been that they're afraid of or that they're concerned. So if, for example, we look at uh, norm seven, states should take appropriate measures to protect their critical infrastructure from ICT threats. Um, if, for example, your uh, critical infrastructure, say your electricity networks, are used to launch a cyber attack against another state, what is your due diligence duty? What should you have done beforehand to protect it? What should what protections should you have had in place reasonably? Uh, should you have had sort of system monitoring in place so you can spot the intrusion early on? Um, and what is an appropriate response to say the, the target state informing you about um, an attack taking place. So uh, it says that states have to respond to appropriate notices and then take appropriate measures. The really interesting question is what does that mean? Um, and uh, what happens if this duty is violated? Are states then liable for compensation to the target state because they have not protected their critical infrastructure, um, which was then abused to uh, launch a devastating cyber strike from a state that ultimately never is identified. So the duty applies even if the attack is never attributed. Um, and uh, we can, and, and norm eight, states should respond to appropriate requests for assistance by another state whose critical infrastructure is subjected to malicious ICT acts. I mean, what does that mean in detail? Uh, when can you reject the request as saying this is not appropriate? What is the level? Um, and what kind of assistance do you have to allow in if you don't have the capability to deal with something yourself? Um, does it mean allowing teams from a foreign state, maybe the target state or another friendly state of your choice in to tackle with an incident happening, uh, abusing your networks? Does it mean allowing private companies in to deal with an incident on your state networks perpetrated presumably by a state actor from another country? What are the, the implications here and, and how can that framework be organized? And at what point does not going along with a request or not going along with an offer of assistance um, appear unreasonable in the eyes of international law? And so if you've acted unreasonably, then you have um, you're inviting uh, uh, claims for compensation. So these are all things to think about. And also, uh, especially when it comes to neutrality, we talk a lot about critical infrastructure, and that's a term that pops up again and again in the uh, relevant cyber norms debates and in national legislation um, and in European legislation quite a lot, um, but it is not defined internationally. There's no clear rule what exactly is critical infrastructure, what, are, uh, what is the scope. Um, so you, we could have a situation where a state claims, say, everything connected to its military uh, is critical infrastructure, which includes private companies owned by the military, and therefore they should be immune from attack, for example, uh, and, uh, and demand okay. assistance if, if something happens. So. Um, Mm -hmm. There are great complexities here um, that, that we will have to deal with, but uh, the fact that this debate is going on in such detail, I mean, everything I've cited here has been uh, discussed either in the text or in the footnotes of the, uh, the Talon manual or uh, on the fringes of some of the uh, big mm -hmm. cyber norms debates going on. So this is not completely unrealistic um, or, or sort of an academic legal discussion. This is something that um, 
people expect to happen at some point and uh, it would be mm -hmm. a good idea to have the relevant legal framework in place before a crisis happens and not trying to figure this out uh, while states uh, threaten escalation and violence because of an ongoing cyber attack. Yes, that's great. So now let's go to Maurice. I think you're on mute. I'm not sure I'm the only one that cannot hear you. Sorry, thanks okay, for great. remembering me. So uh, the question to operationalize neutrality, um, I wanted to come with the mention of the axis of complexity. <laughs> I wanted to, to address it, but in the second part. Um, well, we could consider that the uh, norms could cover axes of complexity or a group of norms. And uh, I, I think it's a, it's a good way to do it. I would start, for instance, with norm three, um, where state should not knowingly allow their territory to be used for, uh, I would say, cyber <laughs> passages. So, I mean, coming to the use of territory, no vacuum and uh, Koshiro Spaki Komiyama said it very well. I mean, this is about state parameter also with players that are dealing with ICT and data and data. And this is something that we have to understand. It's not only uh, the, the tool, it's the raw material, which is, which is data. And so if we are able to understand the relays, the proxies, make inventories, catalog, mapping, then we will operationalize neutrality because we will be able to build a context and to define some borders. Having a look at norms, I would group them six, seven, and eight, which are dealing with critical infrastructure. I would say the first is, um, as I mentioned before, there is this information sharing to help the maturity of this critical infrastructure to be hardened so that cyber threats, cyber attacks will not harm them at a level where measures regarding neutrality even have to be considered. As an example, I think it's quite interesting to see, depending on your definition of critical infrastructure, norm 11, that says that you don't have to hurt certs. If cert is a critical infrastructure and could be considered as such, there is no specificity of this norm 11. Now, regarding the operationalizing of protection of this neutrality, uh, it's generally done, if I have a look at cyber defense with MOUs or technical agreements, intergovernmental agreements that are focused on training and information exchange. And having a look on training, there is an interesting example with uh, cyber training ranges. Because cyber training ranges both can be used as training instrument and also for weaponry. And so, uh, I mean, if we define clear rules, if we define clear inventories on what is, has to be considered as for instance, a training purpose and what not, then we will help neutrality being able to be described. And of course, this leads to policy application. And I think the context helps to understand uh, the terms of neutrality to be operationalized in terms of scenarios. So defining scenarios that help to understand inventory and illustrate the considerations necessary to address neutrality in a specific context of cyber tension on conflicts. Now, where goes support, supporting partners, supporting uh, belligerents? Up to what kind of limit? Is it technical, organizational, political, and as such linked to neutrality aspects to be taken into consideration? And I, I, I would like to take an example from the modern cyber literature that plagiarizes a more classical say. Uh, and mm -hmm. e.g., it's to attribute or not to attribute. 
to attribute or not to attribute. Being able not to attribute is preserving your neutrality. Mm-hmm. And this is a real challenge for a neutral state. Mm-hmm. And can attribution be considered as a breached obligation? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That's great. Thanks so much, Mohis. And uh, just on the last point on attribution, not just, of course, like in preserving the status of neutrality and thinking about not attributing as part of that process, but also thinking about another thing that I'm not sure whether it was you or another uh, speaker that brought this was also thinking about attribution as this delegation, or perhaps that whole discussion around, you know, having an independent body that focuses on attribution, or having some kind of group of experts that can help in this process. So great. Now let's uh, go directly to um, Otavia. Yes, um, thank you. So in full disclosure, in order to reply to this question, I had to um, um, ask um, support to one of my colleagues who's way much more expert international norm than I am. So thanks to, to her. Um, but also, I would like to start with a, a quick reflection on, on something I read in the Cyber Defense Report written by Sean Kevin. So thanks to you as well. Um, but I found very interesting how uh, you referenced to the uh, five political functions of neutrality, according to uh, Ricklin. And um, so looking at that, um, I start thinking what of these functions um, we follow, let's say, at the Institute, a civil society organization to uh, operationalize uh, neutrality, or at least trying to do so. And I think that integration is one of the main functions we, we follow. Um, this because we work to, um, we, we see to apply uh, the function of integration by convening a, a diverse range of stakeholders to act on issues that threaten the protection of human rights in cyberspace, but also to act on pressing, pr- uh, pressuring cyber threats uh, targeting uh, vulnerable communities. Um, and uh, we, we, we managed to convene a wide range of stakeholders like the one uh, represented here today, because we know that we have the shared mission of protecting cyberspace. Um, and, and for instance, to give you an example, um, together with industry partners, the Institute uh, published um, the Multi-Stakeholder Manifesto, which aims to ensure that any cybercrime uh, convention preserves and upholds basic human rights and freedoms uh, guaranteed under existing international UN and other treaties. So this manifesto is is an example of uh, neutrality as a uh, multi-stakeholder cooperation to to promote protection of victims, international cooperation, but also focus on accountability mechanism and uh, preservation of an open internet. And looking at all these principles as something to be followed to underpin rights and and liberties in the discussion of uh, cybercrime treaties. Um, and so like, I would like to connect this reflection on uh, to the question of how the, um, the principle of neutrality is actually echoed in ongoing international discussions. And uh, I think it, it is, it just, once again, as we, we all say, it's, it's very challenging. And, um, but the fact that all the challenges that we might face doesn't mean that uh, we should not uh, look at all the achievements uh, reached uh, in, um, for example, OEWG or GGE uh, for us, and specifically, uh, the data related um, reports that um, lately have provided clear guidelines on um, how to implement the 2015 GG norms, because that's where everything kind of started, right? Um, and so, um, at least the Institute is part of our work to, to, to stand ready to assist stakeholders in the implementation of these norms. And, um, and we base a lot of our work in um, on the international recognition that critical infrastructure like healthcare facilities should be off limits to cyber attacks. These for all the reasons uh, I've said before and we all said right now. Uh, but I think an important point to stress out here is that we need to keep in mind that the GG norms only apply to states. And this is one stakeholder rather than the whole community. So these norms are important, but uh, we still need to push for a multi-stakeholder effort. And uh, we believe that um, efforts like activities we do at the Institute, but also done by many other organizations out there uh, are important mechanism to support implementation of these norms. And um, um, I just, uh, as an exercise, I I look at one of the GG norm, once again, because I'm not expert, um, but like looking at GGE norm um, seven, that I think we all kind of mentioned, in a way I see neutrality uh, there in, in two ways, potentially. One, like a state approach to infrastructure protection as positive obligation to protect um, critical infrastructure, but also 
as uh, again cooperation efforts mm -hmm. so i would say that um just to conclude that there is room to apply the principle of neutrality to international norms and operationalize it uh but it's just a long way and to do it we just need to work together bottom line that's great thanks so much otavia anastasia Thank you. I would just compliment what have been said before. Um, I agree with that Tavia to highlight that the NOS, those norms are actually um, about this responsible state behavior. Um, it would be, a, I think, also good to understand how those norms coexist with international law, uh, where actually the law of neutrality, as I understood, is a part of. So the relation between those non-binding norms and the law of neutrality would be quite interesting to hear if um, some further states who would be more vocal about um, how they see the application of the international law to cyberspace could also be more specific about this. So I think it could also help to non state actors to understand how they could then to use this uh, to define their roles and their activities in this regard. The other aspect that I wanted to highlight, many of those terms actually have been already operationalized um, by both states and non-state actors. Um, we really did a really good and interesting research, and I see some people from the BP app on cybersecurity here, about how the security incidents have triggered the norm implementation. And we have seen, um, I had this specific case of a hard blade vulnerability, and I did the interview of some security researchers. Well, the in most of the questions, did you know about the specific norm, specifically the norm to responsibly report vulnerability? And they said, no, I, of course, I wasn't really aware of this, but did you implement this? And the practice showed that they did. So lots of the researchers, lots of the third communities already operationalized those norms in the day-to-day -day activities. The question is, how could we actually have this knowledge? Where those norms are working, where those norms are not working, what are the challenges with this? So this probably would be really helpful. And I know about the, the idea of some of the delegations, such as the Australia and the Mexico, if I'm not mistaken, to have this a national survey of the implementation. So definitely this would be a really practical solution in this regard. Um, one of the norms I think is missing here, um, again, based on the previous communications with the security researchers mostly, is how to help through the norms of or through any bilateral multilateral agreements to help the security researchers and incident responses, despite the political or geopolitical context, despite the sanctions, to be able to exchange the vulnerability information with each other, to be able to actually to help with to each other if there's some significant incident taking place, how to do with this. We know that um, because of this political context, some of the third communities kind of cooperate with each other, be they in Russia or China or in Iran, but still they are victims who could be um, needed this help. And I think, again, having some neutral intermediary, I love the comment here. Uh, I don't know if the director Durant has agree with this or not, but I, I think having some international organization that might be helping to escalate a depoliticized situation would be certainly helpful, again, to those who need to do the job. So it's all from my side. Thank you. Thanks, Anastasia. Um, and I think that that kind of transitions nicely to Koichiro. Oh, thank you. I think my remark will be a little bit similar to what uh, Anastasia just mentioned. Uh, of course, I will pick up the norm 11, uh, the protection of third. Uh, um, significant change have taken place between the time these norms were initially agreed upon and now. Until 2015, national search in various countries were funded and operated by academic research institutions and domain name registry registrars. And even national search within the, within the government were allowed, allowed a certain degree of independence with very few cases being set up under the military or intelligence agencies. Now, 2020, 21, uh, national search has been tightly incorporated as a function of the government. Uh, positive effect is we have searched almost all countries. Uh, negative side is it is losing its character as a global epistemic community. Uh, the protection of certain norm, I think, can be reconsidered uh, because the boundary between search, intelligence agency, and military was, was, was not clear from the beginning and becoming less unclear uh, to this day. Uh, if national suit work more and more for uh, national interest, a uh, global network of security experts should fill in the blank. 
several leading thesis like Sarko from Luxembourg, Switch from Swiss. They are not the national thesis, but they, they work more for, uh, for global good. My last point is, uh, it is precisely because of this, uh, as, as described in Sean and Kevin's report, the idea of uh, permanent neutral countries supporting the global CSAT community like FIRST, a forum of incident response team, is an excellent idea. FIRST is a global membership organization uh, cybersecurity professionals from all over the world have joined this group to develop industry standards such as common vulnerability scoring system or traffic light protocol, TLP, and to establish a code of conduct for security engineers. Uh, but as an organization, FIRST is a 501c3 NPO registered in the United States. Uh, some of its activities are restricted by regulation in certain countries. So uh, I really welcome Switzerland's support uh, and it would increase the flexibility of global CSAT community, CSAT activities. Thank you very much. Thanks, uh, Kuechiro. Um, that is such an interesting point. I do remember just a couple of years ago over at the IGF having sessions discussing Norm 11, which is uh, the one around the protection, uh, not normally uh, support activity or harm related to certs, uh, or the Norm 7, which is a uh, request for assistance, or another one which is related to requests for assistance. And it's so interesting that you mentioned uh, that maybe the format of national certs have been changing and that changes the possibility of neutrality in that sense or protection, right? Which is a very close word to what we have been discussing. Um, I just wanted to kind of uh, pass it over. I mean, just check if Sean would like to chime in like one minute because we're short on time and I wanna open up the discussion. If you'd like to add something also uh, circling back to the whole research. You know, thanks. Um, so lots of things have already been said and sort of comparing and sort of finding analogies and links between these norms and also what the actual principles uh, of neutrality are, are described in, in the law. Um, I might just sort of add um, something more related to, to norm six, uh, like norm three and sort of seven have been discussed, but norm six, not that much. It mostly states that um, states must not conduct nor knowingly sort of support ICD activities contrary to its obligations under international law that internationally damages critical infrastructures. So it's kind of also been discussed all. But it is this whole concept of what support can actually mean um, in terms of, of cyber. With words, and we might sort of want to look back to the law of neutrality and, and, and see that support can mean, for example, directly engaging, but also the provision of different sort of materials. Uh, and in the cyber context, this could also mean intelligence, but also vulnerabilities or even targets. So, so these are important sort of uh, things to, to keep in mind. It could also mean the provisions of software or, or what is commonly called or known as cyber weapons, even though that's a quite a, a debated term itself. Um, but voilà. but it, so it also sort of brings the, the, the general question, if I raise general questions about uh, what can be done with regards to, to these issues of, of support. Um, and one sort of a potential answer key that I want to highlight, but Jan has already highlighted, is this whole question of export control regimes for different types of dual use technologies, which are explicit things that I think, and I guess other people think too, is going to need to be addressed at some point, uh, be it through the, the lens of neutrality or sort of uh, other lenses themselves. Excellent, excellent. Um, right now, I just wanted to kind of open up the discussion to all of our kind of audience here or over at the IGF uh, in Poland uh, physically. So I wanted to give the opportunity also because I don't know how many people we have on the room, but if someone is on the room and would like to chime in and uh, ask a question, please uh, feel free to do so. And I guess the, the IGF uh, supporting staff will, will help you through that. Um, but in this moment, I noted that Craig Jones uh, made a couple of remarks here over in the chat. So I was wondering, um, are there any questions? Craig, would you like to jump in and, and make your comment um, uh, over here? I'm not sure if- I can do it, I can oh, do it for the room. Perfect, great. Oh, great. Perfect. So, uh, yeah, thank you very much. Uh, following this with uh, great interest, and I've put a few comments um, in the chat as well. 
Um, it's about sort of roles, responsibilities and organisations and having very clear mandates. Um, as I say, I'm a director of cybercrime for Interpol. I lead the global programme for 195 member countries. I've been wrestling for the last two and a bit years about what that looks like and, and where we can add that value. Um, so now develop the new strategy. We're involved in the new uh, ad hoc uh, convention, but we're seeing a, a politicisation now also of cybercrime. So we can see whereas our common denominator that we deal with is, is just crime and we try and keep it at that level. But I think what we can see now is the countries uh, coming on and using the cybercrime as a, a, a national security issue as well. That is going to make it a lot more difficult, certainly for, for law enforcement, when we try and coordinate and facilitate those uh, cross-border investigations. So drawing it down then to the lowest common denominators of which regions and which countries can work together in those geopolitical groups, and then looking at using Interpol as, as a neutral um, interlocker to bring those investigations, operations together. But again, we can only do it in the crime area. So that's my sort of concern as we go forward is about the politicization of, of cyber crime. So that was just a comment I wanted to make. Thank you. Excellent comment. Um, would any of the speakers would like to comment on the, on the comment that was raised by Craig? If not, I mean, I'm just going to comment on your comment. Oh, okay. I see Jan. Jan, please go ahead. Okay. I mean, on, on the general question of neutrality of, of international organizations, NGOs, I and mean, it's quite instructive to look at the history of the Red Cross. I mean, why does it use the Red Cross? It's a deliberate inversion of the Swiss flag. Yeah, it had no legal position to claim permanent neutrality as a newly founded organization. So they did the closest thing possible by inverting this flag and sort of trying to to, to get this status. Um, and it's quite instructive to look at sort of the struggle the organization has faced through the decades and through world wars to maintain that status. Um, and uh, uh, it could be quite instructive to look at that from, from the perspective of CERTs because you have the Red Cross as a deliberately neutral organization that will sort of work with anyone in the interest of humanity. But you also have the Red Cross symbol used by the medical services of any armed forces who then go into the battlefield and demand certain privileges uh, and, and, and rights not to be targeted based on that symbol. So I think that could, there's, a, there's a quite interesting analogy here that I haven't really thought about ever, but I think this could be really interesting. Yes, and I think uh, Anastasia very rightfully kind of spot on uh, shared here um, a paper from the ICRC, uh, which talks about a digital emblem to mark some ICT infrastructure off limits, uh, which goes back to kind of that discussion that we started to have around what could be considered kind of the Article 15 of the Geneva Conventions that talks about kind of safety zones and neutralized zones. Obviously, you know, we need to think about peacetime. And I think this whole discussion around uh, protecting healthcare from uh, cyber attacks, for example, and having kind of a common understanding that this is a no-go. So states cannot kind of do that. But what happens when we're looking at potentially kind of cyber espionage operations that, as we know, kind of fall below the threshold that, you know, are very blurry and it's very difficult to understand what is being done there. It can be just a reconnaissance operation. So how, how you know, how can we deal with the concept of neutrality in those contexts, right? So I would just like, I mean, I am waiting for more questions, but from the audience, I hope we have triggered that. But I really wanted to kind of have, I had this burning question around kind of the protection of healthcare, because I think this is something that we've been discussing a lot in this past, you know, since the start of the pandemic. Um, so how have, uh, you know, just whoever wants to kind of jump in and talk about that, but how can we think about the concept of neutrality in that context, given even kind of cyber espionage operations kind of using those networks, even if to only leverage to get into another system. How can we deal with that? Mohiz? Yes, thank you. First of all, I would like to, uh, to emphasize on an initiative that Switzerland uh, took uh, with international humanitarian uh, law uh, that we uh, tried to um, apply to uh, to the cyberspace uh, really in a very systematic way and uh, of course we uh, we 
uh, we made it uh, within the administra federal administration, uh, Department of Foreign Affairs, uh, Defense, and also uh, our National Cyber Security Center. And then we checked it with the ICRC because we thought it was be it was very very interesting. Now coming to the the point that you mentioned, I think there are two main aspects again related to complexity. And the first aspect uh, is the indirection. So the problem is that if you con <laughs> consider, sorry, that health is a human uh, health uh, benefit, having a benefit from a health system is a human right, then there is a perimeter of a uh, neutral zone that you can define. The problem is the indirection uh, and how to, to hit things. For instance, <laughs> I mean, affecting hospital or, or transfer systems uh, would be very clearly visible and it's quite, a, I would say, easy to try to transfer some rules to these domains and also to see the threshold of violations. But now, if you go into data integrity, having uh, some, uh, I would say, uh, uh, attacks on the long run that will affect the efficiency, but that's not clearly visible. And of course, there is the short and long time within cyberspace that we have to take into consideration. So it's very, very difficult to have a clear model. So I think the, 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 the first suggestion that we did is we, we considered that some sectors that can be considered as vital sectors, not critical, but vital sectors, have to be considered on the way they directly can be impacted by cyber threats. And this should be part of what could be defined a neutral or non-threatable zone. Very interesting. Any other uh, speaker would like to chime in and respond to that question as well? No, see not. I, I was like, I was looking at Otavia to perhaps like see, um, but but please feel free. Um, I see Anastasia. Um, just very quickly, I don't have obviously the answer because it's a really quite difficult question to um, have a black and white answer. But just to highlight um, one of the areas that we are dealing with and we are theoretically keeping in mind um, that um, those threat intelligence that our colleagues produce publicly and actually provide the information about the vulnerability analysis or some technical information analysis of this um, malware that has been investigated could potentially and theoretically could be abused by some states, those that could be part of the cyber conflict. And this is actually, even those, those who abuse this information are not our users and not our customers, but still, without even our intention, of course, without even our knowledge, this is some of the risks that we need to take in mind. And obviously this is the open questions that we do not have the answer yet, how to deal with this. But just to add to the lots of the questions we discussed one more. Yes, that's absolutely true. I think this, uh, this panel was definitely kind of raising questions about, you know, uh, the blurry lines of applicability of international law, international humanitarian law. So um, I see that Amir uh, Mokaberi um, submitted a question here. Amir, would you like to unmute and, and quickly just ask your question? And uh, then we go for a last round before we close up. Uh, hello, uh, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Uh, thank you very much. Hello, everyone, and uh, distinguished panelists. Uh, I would like to ask uh, one question here regarding uh, application of uh, neutrality principle. How can neutrality principle uh, be applied uh, without having an international legitimate attribution framework? For example, uh, uh, under auspices of the United Nations, uh, and lack uh, and considering lack of cyber capacity building needed for the diligence and uh, protection of uh, critical infrastructure for all countries, 
and uh, also possibility of fabricated uh, attribution and also uh, uh, with respect to uh, the phenomenon of cyber attacks with the mask of other parties with these conditions uh, how can a neutrality be applied thank you very much thank you amir i see jan has already raised his hand jan okay thank you um i I think this uh, uh, touches an important point that also explains why there's so much legal complexity about the status of a lot of these norms. Uh, because if you, for example, consider that the official US cyber strategy um, explicitly mentions that cyber attacks uh, by US forces will usually be routed through third countries to make sure that they cannot be tracked as easily. Um, if you then look at that uh, uh, from the angle of uh, due diligence duties, uh, you will then understand why the United States has not so long, has so far not publicly uh, committed to due diligence in cyberspace as an international norm. Um, so that's where we're clearly hitting uh, uh, boundaries of state interest. And that's uh, where my argument comes from, that I don't think we will clarify this around the table uh, of an international meeting where states agree certain rules are now binding. Um, but what is more likely is that we will have uh, some form of international conflict where these rules come into play and states will clarify the expectations of each other. Um, and then um, cyber experts and many defense ministries across the world will then think about what does that mean for our official strategies of using other people's networks to, to hide our tracks. Well, that, that, that is a, a, a grim scenario, but I, I do hope that we can uh, find a kind of a common ground uh, before uh, something something kind of the doom cyber day kind of happens. Um, but yes, um, Maurice. Yes, a, a short addition to what has been said and to answer the, the question. I think there are two axes of answers. The first is to be able to define what is allowed or not. And uh, according to this, my our, our view or our thoughts are linked to there must be we must be able according to a un uh, view to define some parameters and once again in the end it will depend on the context it's not something that can be described in a generic way the second thing the second axis is being able to take measures and here once again this is a very uh, complex thing it's according to um, security policies and here i think we're far away to find a solution thank you Thanks, Mohis. Any other comments from uh, the speakers? Okay, if not, I am going to just um, ask uh, either Jacob, Sean, or Kevin, whether there are any other remarks that you would like to make with regards to our discussion. I would certainly love to thank you, Louise, for navigating us through these uncharted waters as we are mapping our surroundings, how are we applying neutrality law to, to cyberspace? I, I think it's been an immensely rich discussion. So a great thank you from, from my side to all our speakers. I think we've had um, a lot of wealth of, of details in terms of how neutrality can be of value as we think about enhancing stability in cyberspace and the different contributions that a multitude of stakeholder communities can offer. And in that sense, I hope that this has been an interesting discussion for, for you in the audience. Um, I know that neutrality at times can seem a rather abstract and therefore daunting concept, um, but we, what we were hoping to show to you today with our discussion is that there are a lot of steps and considerations um, that are already being made to see really how do we translate um, this into, into practice and, and really tease out the, the value of, of neutrality beyond just the discussions on, on norms. And this is a conversation that definitely needs to, to continue going forward. I think we've seen that it's an issue that's not 
only concerning states. Um, there are interests and activities of a growing group of, of actors that are being touched on. We've heard from Greg Jones also that it's not only a question of, of actors, it's actually also increasingly uh, a question of, of issues with the politicization of, of, of cybercrime. So lots of complexity to, to unpack there. Uh, thank you all for being part of this. Thank you for your input. Back to you, Louise. Yes, absolutely. I would like to thank you all, uh, all the speakers, all of the audience, both virtually and uh, physically over there. I hope that next year we can continue this conversation, hopefully face-to-face uh, -face somewhere in the world. Um, but yes, um, I think that we have kind of, our expectation was to get to the end of this discussion with like very, very concrete takeaways. Although I do think that we have them, I think this was a mapping exercise of different views around neutrality, right? Uh, I think what we leave this discussion thinking about, at least I do, and I hope all of us do, is about, as Jakob already said, the geopolitical implications, the context that we're living in, uh, of uh, an OEWG starting next week of uh, uh, an ad hoc committee on cybercrime developing a treaty around this, uh, starting negotiations in January next year, um, processes that will kind of touch very concretely in the blurry lines between cybersecurity and cybercrime. We're also talking about uh, a moment where many states have started to publish their views. Hopefully they will continue to do so, uh, so that we can have more clarity as to these interpretations. But I do think that what, one thing that I would highlight of this uh, mapping exercise that we kind of um, got into here collectively is definitely knowing that neutrality is, uh, goes way beyond kind of just thinking the state. Uh, it is something that uh, many other actors, non-state actors kind of rely on or kind of try to think critically about uh, because whoever decides what is neutral or who is neutral or, or what gets to be neutral has political power, right? So I think at the end of the day, that is something that requires a lot of our attention. And I think Sean, uh, Jakob specifically, and uh, Kevin for the amazing work that they published, I would definitely recommend you read it uh, because I do feel that it adds to this literature uh, for us to pin down what it means and the political implications and international law implications for these kinds of debates. So that is me. I've spoken enough. I'd just like to thank you all and I hope to see you next uh, year. <laughs>